meeting is going to be giving some of the details of what we've learned about the Farm River watershed so far, uh, talking about some opportunities for folks to get involved, uh, the schedule and some timing of where things will be going in the future. Um, and so it's, this, is a, this is an opportunity for folks that are interested in the Farm River watershed to provide some input to us at the district and Fawcett O'Neill of things that they think are priorities, environmental and water quality priorities in the watershed, um, but also a chance to learn how you can help move things along as we, as we develop the plan. Um, this meeting is gonna be recorded by Tawtucket TV uh, in the North Brantford Community Access Channel. It's also gonna be on Facebook Live and I am recording this meeting um, so that we will be able to share this after the fact for folks that couldn't meet it tonight or make it tonight. Um, I do ask that if you're not asking a question that you mute your microphones. And as we're going through the presentation, there will be a couple of points where we'll stop and take a question and answer session. Um, you can also put questions into the chat window um, and we will, I will capture those as some of the first questions to ask our presenters from Fuss and O'Neill. If you're not sure where the chat window is, if you move your mouse down to the bottom of the screen, um, there should be a little bubble that comes up and says chat. You click on that, it'll open up on the, probably the right side of your computer screen. You can type in there um, and I will capture those and we'll use those as the first questions um, when we have discussion breaks. So with that, I am going to turn over the presentation to Eric Moss from Fawcett O'Neill, who's going to lead us through a, uh, the first series of slides. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Eric. Great. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, let me just uh, share my screen with everyone. And uh, hopefully this is seamless. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Eric Moss. I'm with Fawcett O'Neill. Um, our firm was hired to uh, work with the, uh, the Conservation District and the project partners to um, you know, help prepare this watershed management plan for the Farm River. Um, just um, a little bit of background about myself and, and our firm. We, um, we've been doing a lot of this work um, across the state of Connecticut uh, over the past 10 or 15 years. And uh, our team has worked on uh, similar watershed planning projects um, for other watersheds in the area, including the West River, uh, Mill River, Quinnipiac, uh, and others. So, um, you know, there's always a lot of similarities in, in some of the area watersheds, but every, every one is really unique. And, um, you know, the point of this meeting tonight is to start to get some input and feedback from the local stakeholders and um, you know, everyone that, you know, is, has a, a stake in, in the watershed and the, you know, the water quality of the Farm River. So, um, also with me tonight is uh, Michael Soares, and uh, Michael's my colleague at Fuss and O'Neill. He's he's doing a lot of the heavy lifting on the on the plan, uh, working with me. He's going to be presenting some of the slides tonight, so um, we'll be doing a little bit of a, a tag team effort on uh, on the presentation. So let me just try to um, advance the slides here. So uh, a bit about our agenda tonight. So we've got a, a two hour time block. Um, we're going to you know, present um, a variety of information and hopefully have some good discussion here uh, tonight. Uh, we'll start off with some introductions and just a bit about our project team. Uh, we will go through the objectives of the meetings and uh, Chris already kind of laid out some of the ground rules and logistics tonight. Um, we will talk about some of the, the previous planning and ongoing um, initiatives in the watershed, some of the stuff that's already been done uh, for the Farm River. And then we're going to we're going to split our presentation into kind of three large uh, topic areas. One is the, the watershed planning process, and after that presentation, we'll have that uh, that Q and A discussion that Chris mentioned. Uh, we'll go over the uh, an overview of the watershed and, and current conditions in the watershed, and have uh, a discussion following that. And then lastly, we'll talk about water quality and pollutant sources. Um, getting at what, what are some of the issues in terms of some of the uh, water quality uh, impairments, uh, some of the high quality waters that we're trying to protect. And then, then we'll close up with um, sort of a schedule, you know, next steps and um, some closing remarks. So uh, a bit about the project team. Um, again, we are, are contracted working with uh, Chris and the Southwest Conservation District. Uh, we're also working with the Connecticut Council on Soil and, and, and Water. Um, you know, and a variety of other partners, um, you know, the USDA, NRCS, uh, the South Central Connecticut Regional Water Authority, 
uh, and obviously you know our partners at Connecticut uh, Deep, um, as well as uh, a number of the local municipalities. So um, I know that uh, you know, Brantford, North Brantford, East Haven, and Guilford are some, kind of the key uh, municipal stakeholders you know, in this project. And then there are some other partners, including Connecticut DPH, uh, EPA, Source Water Program, uh, and, and some other folks that are, have been involved in the project steering committee that has been active now for you know, a number of months. Um, project funding is uh, coming from the uh, NRCS, the USDA, and it's part of uh, what's called the National Water Quality Initiative or NWQI grant program. And there are also some local matching funds that are, um, are being uh, provided by the conservation district and also the regional water authority. So what are our objectives tonight? Well, you know, one, we want to describe the watershed planning process, you know, early on so that everyone knows, you know, what to expect in terms of you know, how we're going to go about developing a watershed plan. Uh, we are also um, have had the chance already to kind of summarize many of the watershed conditions and issues in the Farm River watershed. So we're going to present that information to everyone. And then we're trying to provide a forum, or at least a, a virtual forum in this case, for stakeholder input and discussion. So re this is really the most important part of, of tonight's meeting in, in my eyes, that you know, we're here to get some early input from you know, the folks that live in the watershed, that have a stake um, in, in, in their conditions of the watershed. And we wanna start to gather, get that feedback and local information so that you know, this watershed plan really reflects uh, the stakeholder input. And what we're going to do from you know from tonight's meeting we're going to take some of this information that we gather uh, along with the background research and really it's going to help establish some of the priorities for us to guide some of our field work for the project and also help with some um, initial plan recommendations and some some ideas that we can start to think about for you know, what should go into this plan uh, again chris already went over the basic ground rules here um, we will have those three discussion breaks, um, you know, after each of the major presentation sections. And what we'd like you to think about, in addition to you know your questions that come up, there are three things that we want you to really focus on. Uh, we're trying to get you know this kind of information out of this meeting. It are you know, one is issues of concern. So if there are specific things that you think are either you know water quality issues, habitat issues, or other. You know, issues that you want to address by this plan. We want you to, you know, to, to tell us that. We also want you to think about, you know, local priorities. Are there specific, you know, sites or problems or, you know, high high quality resources that you're looking to protect with this plan? And we want that kind of input. And then we want you to start thinking about project ideas and at least preliminary recommendations. You know, what are some of the things that maybe are already being done or that some of the, the towns or other stakeholders are considering doing that you think might make sense to be part of this plan. So um, at the breaks, kind of think about those three areas and um, you know, as we kind of discuss different topics, how those things might, um, you know, might, might help you know, guide, guide this plan moving forward. So I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir, but I'm gonna start off really basic here in terms of you know, watershed planning you know, why, why are we looking at the watershed? Well, obviously, you know, watersheds are defined by, by hydrology, you know, and, um, you know, watersheds uh, cross municipal boundaries. So, you know, if we're gonna solve, you know, water quality, you know, water resources issues, it makes the most sense to consider, you know, the watershed as, as the logical framework to do that. And that really helps bring together, you know, folks from different municipalities, you know, help, helps cross, cross boundaries uh, from different towns that are in the watershed that have a shared resource. Uh, and really, you know, watershed management, what does it mean? It really means land use management. You know, how do we manage our, our land and what are the everyday activities that, you know, folks are involved with that impact water quality? And obviously there's a big education and outreach component to any, you know, watershed management effort. So what are some of the previous planning efforts that have happened in, in the Farm River watershed? Um, you know, we, again, we really wanna, we wanna build on what's been done to date and we wanna you know, take advantage of all of the work, the planning work um, that's being done already by the communities and regionally. So, so this project is going to build on a source water protection plan that was developed for the Farm River watershed back in 2011. Uh, this is a cover of that document. 
And this was uh, prepared by the Atlantic States um, Rural Water and Wastewater Association, uh, working pretty closely with the Regional Water Authority. And again, this was focused on you know the drinking water supplies and protecting you know that source water um, that's so crucial to the Farm River. Um, so we're going to build on that um, and update a lot of that information in in that document. We also are um, kind of building on the efforts um, that the municipalities have, um, have have been putting into their municipal plans of conservation and development in terms of some of the uh, you know the conservation practices, policies, regulatory uh, approaches. Um, and then we're also going to, of course, can consider some of the regional planning documents um, you know that that are applicable to this watershed, including the coastal resilience framework that was developed a few years back and then the regional drinking water uh, vulnerability assessment and, and planning document. Okay. I do want to mention a little bit about the regional water authorities uh, source water protection program since they have been you know, implementing that for years now and they're, they're, they're a crucial partner to this project um, and they're a key, a key stakeholder you know, for, for the project. This is just a, kind of a brief summary from some of the slides that, uh, that Ron Walters put together you know, for a presentation to um, you know many of you that are on the stakeholder committee, but it really talks about some of the, the or present some of the highlights of their source water protection program, and I won't go into detail on these, but you know they have yeah. you know a number of um, a number of policies and activities that they undertake on a regular basis, okay. it's looking at site plan review, you know, erosion okay. sediment control uh, in the watershed. Uh, they've got a land acquisition program. Um, you know, the Whitney Water Center is part of their educational programs where they educate, you know, teachers on water issues, and they're also involved in legislative um, activity affecting you know, water, water issues and water supply. So we're going to integrate, you know, a lot of this ongoing work into the watershed plan. Um, this watershed planning effort is actually part of a larger um, pilot project, first water protection project. Uh, a few years ago, the Farm River was selected by NRCS for a nationwide pilot. And so I believe this is one of either 14 or 15 watersheds nationwide that are um, you know, looking at, at watershed planning for uh, source water protection and uh, you know, combining that with some of the agricultural non-point source issues. And uh, so a stakeholder group has been formed, uh, a larger group really to oversee this larger project. Mm -hmm. And that, that group identified the need to develop a watershed plan for the Farm River that addresses both urban non-point source pollution, but also the agricultural non-point source pollution as kind of the, the, the dual uh, sources in this watershed. And we're also looking at protecting um, you know, drinking water, obviously, and even the, you know, the downstream Long Island Sound and the embayments uh, on Long Island Sound, you know, what, what uh, you know, flows downstream from the Farm River enters the sound. So, we kind of have the nexus of, uh, you know, source water protection, drinking water, urban ag, non-point source pollution, and, and water quality in the, in the sense itself. So Chris, if you can just kind of talk about uh, some of the ongoing work in the watershed. Yep. Um, so since I've gotten involved with this project, I've uh, learned about one project that uh, was taking place before I got involved. And uh, we've also picked up another great benefit and uh, definitely wanted to highlight the, the fishway at Pages Mill Pond, uh, which is a great uh, implementation project for the watershed and um, really helps with uh, eliminating a fish passage barrier. Uh, and this was a project that a lot of great partners were involved with. Um, they're listed on the slide with DEP, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Save the Sound, Trout Unlimited and Lindsay Suter, who's the uh, property owner of the dam. Uh, and you know the dam was or the fishway was finished earlier this year. Um, I know before it got dry that uh, from conversations with Lindsay that there were uh, some fish going through it. So that's that's a great success. And you know, knowing that this sort of thing was already happening in watershed makes me believe that when this plan is finished, that we'll be able to do a lot of other great uh, implementation work in the watershed as well. Um, another thing that has happened since we started working on this watershed plan. Uh, USGS actually installed a monitoring gauge uh, on the river. Uh, it just went in in the spring. They're collecting uh, flow data from that gauge, but they're also collecting monthly grab samples. Uh, and the data that they're generating is really going to help us out with learning information about the water and the water quality in the river uh, and connecting it with the flow. So it'll help with concentrations 
and it'll help with uh, any sort of modeling that we need to do in the watershed. So this is a really great benefit and advantage to uh, the work that we're going to be doing with this watershed-based plan to have this excellent data source right in the middle of the watershed. Uh, Eric, if you could advance the slide. So two other things that are moving forward now um, are actually things that we can get volunteers involved with. So hopefully some of the folks that are on this call live or that maybe see this after the fact on Tatucket TV or maybe BC TV or even just post it on the web somewhere. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, myself and Nicole Davis from Save the Sound actually did a, a stream walk training virtually. So this is just a screenshot uh, on the slide from that training. Uh, we talked about the different aspects and characteristics of a stream and what to look for in terms of problems that you might want to make a note of. Um, and both of those, both the presentation and then we also had a field video kind of showing the actual characteristics in the stream are available on YouTube. And these are the, the links are on the slide as well. Um, so if you wanted to go and watch those and learn how to do a stream walk, you could go to those YouTube videos and watch them. And then you could contact Nicole or myself and you would actually be able to um, t fill out some of the data sheets that we have available to give us information on the various segments of the Farm River. Uh, and I also know that a benefit from this project with the stream walking that North Brantford is actually using that as an educational component for their sustainable CT certification. So um, the benefits for the Farm River are one thing, but it's already branching out to other components environmentally and benefiting the, the town of North Brantford. The uh, second volunteer opportunity that I wanted to just mention was there's been some very early, and I'm emphasizing early, discussion of doing some macro invertebrate sampling on the Farm River. Um, this was some conversations that I had with my board at the Southwest Conservation District, but also um, some conversations with the stakeholders and also with Save the Sound. Now, the, on the side, there's some pictures of insects. One is a stonefly on the left and the other is a mayfly on the right. The Trout Unlimited folks on the call probably didn't need me to identify them. Um, these are things that fish eat, but they are also indicators of water quality. Um, so this is a good thing that you can go out and collect these critters that live in the stream. They live underneath the rocks in the benthic, which is the stream bed area. Uh, you can collect these insects and other organisms and do some identification work, and it can really give you a good, good picture of the water quality in the river. Um, there's also a benefit that DEP has some historical macroinvertebrate sites on the river. So if we were to do sampling in some of those same places, we could um, do some comparisons with those data sets and look at if there's been any trends or changes in water quality based on the data collected. So these are two things that folks can get involved with right now. You could do some stream walking and potentially in the fall or maybe later we can do um, some macroinvertebrate sampling. Of course, it's all going to be dependent on how we can do this uh, in the COVID era that we are all existing in right now. Um, Eric, that's all I've got on these slides. Okay, great. And I will say that um, you know the timing of some of that work is great because it may help to inform the watershed plan recommendations that's, you know, themselves, including some of the work that comes out of the stream walks um, in terms of finding project sites and things to follow up on. So uh, we're really hopeful about uh, using that that information to uh, help us craft a plan. Um, so I'm going to cover just the watershed plan development process. And uh, before I get into you know, kind of the scope of the project, um, I just want to say that this, you know, this watershed plan is essentially addressing two sets of related requirements for watershed planning. Um, the, the first uh, shown in the blue box on the top right is what's referred to as the EPA nine elements. And that's really the, the EPA and the Connecticut Deep uh, framework for uh, developing watershed-based plans for um, addressing impaired waters. And so there's a standard, you know, nine elements there um, that are required to be addressed within the plan. And, you know, many of the watershed plans that we work on, you know, address uh, this framework. Uh, the other set of requirements that we're, we're going to be addressing is really the NRCS um, watershed plan framework, which, uh, again, is very similar to the EPA, but there are, you know, a few subtle differences and a few additions um, the NRCS watershed plans, you know, typically focus on, um, you know, agricultural um, practices and conservation practices. Uh, but again, you know, there's a lot of overlap and similarities. We're going to have a, a, a kind of a crosswalk in the document, you know, showing how the, the watershed plan addresses both sets of requirements. Um, so I'm going to just review the, the basic scope items for the, the project. 
you know, right, right now we're in the middle of, um, you know, reviewing and summarizing existing watershed conditions. So we're going to present some more of those tonight. Uh, that's really kind of the, the baseline that we're developing for the watershed plan. Um, tonight's our stakeholder meeting. So we're hoping to get, again, some early feedback um, at the start of the project, essentially. And then we're going to move into uh, some field assessments in the next few months, um, doing some field work. In addition to the streamwalks that Chris mentioned, we will be um, doing some of our own field assessments with Fuss and O'Neill staff, uh, working with Chris and Nicole and others, looking at uh, potential, you know, project sites, whether those are, um, you know, stormwater uh, best management practices, riparian buffer projects, uh, they, they could be, you know, other types of restoration or water quality improvement projects, you know, on specific sites. So we're gonna try to, you know, um, see as much of the watershed as we can, but really focus on where the, the problems are and identify you know, potential projects that we'll include in, in the watershed plan. Um, we're also gonna be uh, doing some pollutant load modeling. And by that, what I mean is that we're gonna be looking at you know, the major um, you know, pollutant types, you know, so nutrients and bacteria and sediment and uh, coming up using some you know, fairly simple models to come up with some estimates of you know, what are the existing loadings of uh, of these pollutants from various land uses and then you know what what can we estimate to be the load reductions that will result from some of the management practices that we're going to recommend in the plan so you know how, how is our plan going to reduce some of the loading so that we can you know come closer or meet those um, water quality criteria right now that are being exceeded in some areas of the watershed uh, so that's that's part of the, the EPA nine elements and also the NRCS watershed plan framework. So we'll, we'll be getting into that following uh, some of our, our field work. Uh, we're also going to identify um, you know kind of a suite of management measures, and those could include um, you know watershed wide policy recommendations, you know non structural practices, um, you know structural control measures, whether they're site specific. Um, so again, stormwater, agricultural runoff. Um, riparian um, corridor practices, upland practices to you know, address some of these uh, Im impaired segments. We're going to take that, you know, work with the stakeholders, you know, look at a number of uh, different management measures, and then prepare the draft watershed plan. Uh, that'll be available for review, you know, by the um, you know by the steering committee basically, and then we'll put together a final watershed plan and have a public presentation, um, you know, at, at the end of the project. We will be holding monthly status meetings, you know, with the project steering committee, and um, so that's going to be, you know, kind of the regular input that we're going to receive from, you know, from the committee as we, you know, go th through the, the process itself. So, this, in a nutshell, is is our project. So, what are the goals for this watershed plan? Well, you know, first and foremost, we're looking to improve and protect Farm River. That's kind of, you know, fundamentally what we're trying to do here. Um, you know. First, we're looking at addressing some of the water quality impairments. So, you know, what are those those areas that have been affected, um, you know, in terms of water quality, and how can we, what, what kind of practices can we recommend to address some of those impairments? Uh, we also are looking to protect uh, the high quality waters, uh, including the drinking, you know, drinking water, source waters, uh, and some of the other, um, you know, stream segments that are not necessarily impacted. And uh, we're also combining, again, source water protection, conservation planning with some of the more traditional urban, you know, suburban stormwater uh, and non-point source runoff issues. Uh, we're also going to touch upon some other related goals. So in addition to water quality, we're also going to be looking at practices that also have benefits to habitat, whether it's restoration or protection through, um, you know, land conservation, and, uh, land use practices. Uh, we also want to look at, at climate resilience. Even though this is not a, a climate resilience plan per se, we are looking at, at recommending things that will have both water quality and, and other benefits such as, you know, flood resilience, um, you know, kind of the using nature-based solutions that have more than just one benefit. So we will you know, try to wrap in some of the, the climate resilience planning work that's been done in the watershed, but also identify kinds of recommendations that we think will benefit, you know, um, water quality, habitat, and potentially, you know, flood resilience. Another goal is really to raise public awareness of um, water quality and the related projects and programs in the watershed. 
you know, a big part of these watershed plans is really getting folks involved and uh, you know raising the level of awareness of of their everyday activities on the, the water quality and resources in in the farm river watershed and in doing so we also want to increase um, community involvement and just strengthen the overall partnership stakeholders in the watershed so you know having regional water authority working with the communities um, you know with the conservation district and the, and the agencies and what we're trying to do is to develop a focused watershed management plan. Uh, typically, you know, these have a 10 year, you know, a five to 10 year planning horizon. So we're trying to be, um, you know, a little bit uh, proactive and come up with recommendations that we think will stand the test of time over the next 10 years. And that's really uh, kind of the, the time frame we're looking at. So that um, ends kind of our first segment. And I guess we could open it up for some discussion again in terms of you know the, the background, the planning process. And what I've done here is I've listed again those three, there's three areas uh, that I'd like folks to kind of focus on you know, throughout the talk. And Chris, I don't know if we have any specific chat questions that have come up yet, um, or if folks wanna you know, go ahead and just ask a, any questions they have so far. Yeah, there, there are actually no chats yet, so we can open it up as a little bit of free-for-all uh, if people you'd have to just unmute yourself to ask a question and we can try to answer those and um, just try to keep it on the process and the part that Eric has already discussed so far as we're going to go through other sections throughout the presentation so some of your uh, other more detailed questions might get answered in future slides can I ask a, a question just for clarification certainly Sorry, my Wi-Fi cut out there. Okay, um, no so my, um, sorry, it might not go through, and I'll put it in a chat if you guys don't hear me. Um, but I was just wondering, are we um, strictly sticking to just the Farm River or to the tributaries that lead into the Farm River as well? Great question, yeah. So it's the entire Farm River watershed. And uh, I think the next few slides, will kind of see the, the geographic scope of the area. So it, it does include the tributaries, um, you know, uh, Gulf Brook um, and a few others, and all the way down to the estuary. So it really is the entire watershed. Okay, so when you go into like the future volunteer opportunities to do the macro sampling, can those be on the tributaries as well as in the Farm River? Uh, they could be almost anywhere. Um, uh, one of the things with the benthic invertebrate sampling is the habitat in the stream needs to be the right habitat. So it has to be a rocky, cobbly bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can't be anywhere near any saltwater or tidal influence either. So um, the habitat will determine where some of those stations can be. And as I mentioned, DEP does have some historic stations that they used in the past. Um, so I would you know, try to focus on some of those first. And then if we had other stations or other locations that might work on like Gulf Brook or Burrs Brook or something like that, we could expend, expend to the, those areas as well. Um, it also depends um, on how many people work on the project. Thank you. Are there any other questions at this point? Still nothing in the chat. Okay. Well, I guess we can we can move on, and then um, what I'm going to do now is. I'm going to hand it over to Michael, who's going to present the next uh, few slides for us. I'll stop sharing, and Mike, if you could just pick up uh, from there. Okay. Let's get my get my screen set here. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Oh, we had this before. Sorry about that. Okay. Nope. <laughs> Maybe if you click off the use presenter view, you may have to just scroll down to yeah. the slide. We'll just. That's not really going to work, is it? You get there. 
All right. <laughs> you will get there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, avert your eyes from this uh, mess, and I'll just introduce myself. Oh, I passed it already. Uh, Good. Hi, everybody. My name is Michael Soares. I'm an environmental scientist with Fuss and O'Neill. Um, I work mostly on wetland science and soil science, uh, some ecological restoration projects, and watershed planning and resource assessments uh, for green infrastructure and all that sort of great stuff uh, involved in conservation projects uh, where we turn planning like this into actual implementations and restoration projects. Uh, so the section I'm going to be presenting for you tonight is really just the overview of um, the watershed. Uh, this is maybe the most basic slide, but it's just a good way to get our bearings on the, the geography of the watershed and then how that intersects, you know, our political landscape. And so you can see that the, the main stem of the Farm River heads up from that estuary uh, through East Haven and kind of runs pretty much a central line through the watershed with a number of uh, major and minor tributaries off of that main stem. And you can just see from the, the approximate uh, percentages and acreages on the side just how much uh, we have in each town. Really the majority is in North Brantford and East Haven uh, with Brantford and then a little bit sneaking over into these other towns to the the east and the north and a little bit to North Haven. So we will get a little more into details on all of these as you'll see as we go forward. So the watershed is about 25 and a half square miles or 16,350 acres. It is broken up into a number of local basins. Um, here it is the 16 classified watersheds. Uh, the first one zero zero uh, is actually the main stem of the of the farm river so if you follow that orange color up through the map you can see how that follows the slight zig and zag of the farm river um, you can also see the major tributaries are labeled here we have burrs brook maloney brook and gulf brook um, and the tidal marsh that is uh, just above the main estuary that's connecting to long island sound or our main tributaries. We will be doing assessments of, of not just the Farm River, but of all of these tributaries um, once we go forward into the field. Uh, it's important to know that, you know, a major transportation corridor passes through the watershed. You know, that has not only the, the uh, jurisdiction of the Department of Transportation in terms of their MS4 permit and their compliance, but also just the resulting land use that comes with uh, such a large transportation corridor, one of the one of the busiest in the country, I would say. Uh, we have a significant area, which we'll get into in a little while, on the regional water authorities, source waters, and the watersheds that contribute to those source waters. Uh, Lake Salton Stall uh, is a significant part of that. And uh, most of the upper watershed, as we move forward, you'll see is, is within that public supply watershed area. Again, tidal wetlands to the south, so unique. We have many coastal uh, watersheds, but it's a unique, um, a unique combination of a freshwater watershed uh, that is also containing some saltwater tidal systems, um, and we can very easily see the the interaction of both, especially with uh, contaminants that as they make their way downstream or uh, higher loads of fresh water or even lower loads of, of fresh water coming down. And there, there is a bit of a break between the watershed itself that we are going to be focusing on and the estuary. Um, so while we're not going to be directly assessing or um, evaluating the estuary. Uh, it's an important piece that will certainly be referenced and considered as we go forward and, and discussing the types of impacts and projects that will be um, will be proposed for Farm River Watershed. Just a little bit on the, the ge uh, topography of the uh, watershed. You can see it's 
quite uh, quite a large change. We have our highest elevation just at the very top of the watershed in Tri Mountain State Park in, in Wallingford, I believe. And then our lowest elevation, of course, is in the tidal marsh at sea level. So 725 feet is a significant change, I would say. Our average elevation in the watershed is around 208 feet. And we wanted to we wanted to show this graphically, and we will have that once we develop the watershed plan. Uh, just thought it was interesting to kind of show the the slopes that we have on the Farm River main stem and some of its sections, and then the main tributaries. I hope everybody has their bearings a little bit. Uh, Gulf Brook is on the east side, just below Lake Gillard. Uh, Maloney is on the west side, sort of across from that, and Gulf Brook is uh, north of Tatucket Mountain. So just to give you a sense. So this is helpful just to see that the headwaters of the farm our rivers start out fairly steep. It's it's all relatively shallow slope, but it starts out fairly steep and then really shallows out as it gets to Pages Mill Pond Dam, pardon that mistake. And then as we get from that dam south to the marsh, it really is um, nearly a level slope going into the estuaries. And the tributaries have different slopes just depending on their, their geography, geology, and underlying soils and um, we have that can play a part in in the types of flushing that occurs in those tributaries, uh, the type of turbidity or incision that's going into the channel, cutting out uh, material, eroding that material out of uh, steeper channels into into the um, into the main stem of the Farm River. So just important context to have. As I said, so our soils is our you know our basic surface layer, and what we have here is uh, US, uh, USDA NRCS Natural Resource Conservation Services hydrologic soils group, and what these help us understand is the sort of the potential runoff and the potential infiltration capacity of the soils in the watershed. So A's and B's are our best soils, uh, C's and D's are getting having a lower infiltration capacity. Uh, D and the combination group below that um, are considered poor. This is, this is mapped at a pretty large scale, uh, probably a federal, a national scale. So we can always uh, do some soil investigations to verify if a site is a good site for a, a green infrastructure project, if it'll actually make sense at that site. But this gives us a good, um, a good base to work off of. And so you can see that's the breakdown. It's pretty good. And you can see that, well, we'll see going forward, the, the higher well-draining soils, interestingly, not surprisingly, match up with the more agricultural soils and some of the, um, the public supply watershed recharge areas. So, so those soils serve a number of purposes beyond just um, giving us opportunities for green infrastructure. Uh, so we can look at the watershed and its use or the uh, types of land use and how that can impact the water quality. Uh, this is one way to do it. This is land use, which is a, a, a classification system that the local council of governments has on um, different, I think that it's parcel based. So depending on how the parcel is used. So you can see the, the yellow is the residential. That's primarily what we see through the, the middle and northern parts of the watershed with more commercial industrial institutional use down below. This is a helpful guide on land cover, but we should move to the next slide where we can actually see uh, land cover. Also, I would say we're, this is a initial version of this map and you, you can see the bottom three categories um, you know, comprising a little bit over 20% are areas that we want to try to refine what what the data means by no land use or other or, or not having a value. Um, so we will try to refine that, but um, we'll, we'll get to land cover next, I apologize. We, this is uh, impervious cover. Again, we're looking at the amount of impervious cover per local basin in the watershed. So this is 
done by uh, Yukon Clears Group. Um, 2015 data. Uh, there are about 43 local basins here, I believe, with the average impervious cover being around 9%. The Farm River main stem is what we're mentioning there is 10.6 on the main stem. The public watershed basins, which we'll see in a minute, those are mostly north of, I'd say, Foxen Road, where Burbrook is sort of coming across on the east side. From there north, well, no, it comes a little far south, um, but mostly from there north, it's all the uh, public watershed, um, public, public, watershed, public watershed supply watersheds. Uh, you can see south of that, which is a little bit east and south, and then west of Lake Saltonstall, we have a higher impervious cover average in these basins, with some of them getting up into the 20s. And Connecticut, uh, I think it was probably deep, has come out with um, research showing that when we get to around 11 or 12 percent impervious covers, when we start to see uh, consistent degradation of water quality correlated to that level of impervious cover. So once again, we see that dominating farther to the south below Fox and Road with an average of about 12 or 13 percent, and then having some of these basins be, be uh, quite developed. Uh, this is what I was talking about two slides ago on the land use which is this, this higher detail also provided by Yukon Clear uh, looking at land cover. And so here we can see uh, a, a lot more detail in terms of where the, um, the development and uh, open space and, and the other areas. We have 12 categories that they um, can provide for us and, and really get a better understanding of where the densities are, um, where the open space is, so you can see the overall percentage of development. We consider development, that first row, as well as turf and grass, um, uh, can be all clumped together as development. Agriculture for the watershed is around 9%. Uh, forest is around 41%, and then a number of others. Uh, the barren at 2.79, I think most of that is the uh, the uh, con property. So that comes in as having no no real cover essentially. So and then a fair bit of wetlands and water bodies as well. So we thought it would help just to kind of pull out some of the uh, most relevant areas and, and look at those both for the watershed themselves and then looking at the public supply watersheds, and then the non-public supply watersheds. And so you can see the correlation between, you know, the forest really being in the watersheds, uh, water, public, public watershed supply watersheds. Uh, interestingly, the development, we can see it sort of spread through the, through both of those areas um, because we have we have dense pockets, not only to the south, but also central and uh, up through the northern parts of the watershed as well. And then agriculture is really in within the public watershed supply watersheds uh, to the center and, and north of the watershed. But CLEAR has taken that one step further and given us uh, some data looking just at the riparian corridors a riparian corridor, for those of you who might not know, I'm sure most of you do already, is a, a buffer area uh, adjacent to a stream or a water body. And the distance we that was used by CLEAR in this analysis is a 300-foot buffer from that shoreline or center line of a stream, both intermittent streams and perennial streams. And so we can see what, what is really going on adjacent to our water bodies. and there's a lot going on here, but it's just a way to kind of break down these 16, 16 local basins into sort of what dominates in each of them. And so you can see the red going on the top two rows is development. Uh, the deeper red is just a higher, higher percentage of development. 
agriculture, forest is quite dominant in a lot of the um, in the watersheds. It, just to talk about the top row where the names are, uh, the blue are where that basin is entirely a local basin that is a public watershed supply local basin. So all the water from that drainage area is going into a is part of the public watershed supply. Uh, the slightly grayish off color parts of those basins are within it and parts are not. And then the two white ones uh, are not part of the public watershed supply in any way. And so you can see some of those are, are quite high depending on um, that relationship of being part of the area that is either conserved or considered part of the, the, of the drinking water supply. So we have a number of resources that we can uh, just try to summarize about the watershed. Um, oh, sorry about that. So as a total, we have about 21% is considered core forest. This has three categories of contiguous areas greater than 500 acres uh, and 250 to 500 and then below 250. So that's really helpful in, in trying to look at the 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 quality of a forest, it's, it's ecological integrity for a number of, of different categories. 15% uh, is wetlands. And then the NDDB, that's the National Diversity Database, uh, they create some generalized areas on areas of concern, of areas where there may be uh, species of concern to the state. That's all of us. And so 30% is only approximate because those are not exactly mapped. They're, they're generalized, so uh, uh, precise locations of, of rare and endangered species are not, um, are not uh, just mapped out in the open. They can, people can always request and get that information. Um, so just given a general idea of that distribution, you can see most of the core forest is, is up in the regional water authority's property, um, followed by a lot of uh, other edge forest and uh, other types up there. And then the NDDB is kind of spread out through, but there's there's a number of unique habitats. We've only mentioned Tatucket Mountain and the salt marsh here, but um, systems like this uh, that are interfacing with the coast and have a lot of elevation change, um, you can get a lot of unique places, um, not just the salt ridges like Tatucket. Our mapping here is of the uh, open space so far uh, mapped. Uh, it's a little, a little difficult to represent all mapping be, of open space because we have, as I'm sure you know, a number of different uh, entities that get involved in uh, either acquisition of private uh, open space or there's public open space. There's also easements on, on farmland. Um, we have easements on, on private properties sometimes. So this is this is our starting point on the open space. Um, you can see the pink is the majority of it, which is the regional water authorities uh, source water protection areas. Um, but like I said, there's a variety of mechanisms. So this gives us a general idea of um, where the protected areas are. We do have some significantly large tracks, especially in relation to the, the reservoirs. So that covers our current conditions and a, a summary of uh, the watershed itself. Anybody has any questions about this section or uh, um, feel free to unmute and do our best to answer your questions. Yeah. Michael, there's no questions in the chat box right now, so it'll just be if anybody has a question that they want to just yeah. speak up about. Chris okay. Malik here. Um, you're going to look at ag lands, agricultural lands. Is there any way to differentiate between different types of ag lands? In other words, row crops, hay and pasture, orchards, tree farms, so that you can kind of zero in on some of them plants that are more vulnerable to soil erosion. And also I think if there's a way to put a slope factor in there, that might also be a useful um, 
analysis when it comes to ag lands? That's a good point. I, you know, being a, this is partly an NRCS project, uh, they are going to be more involved as we go forward. And I think uh, it's possible that maybe some NRCS folks might, might be here, but I, I would imagine for those farms that have conservation plans, uh, we might have some understanding of some of that data from conservation planning uh, or just the, the, the summarized understanding that NRCS has of the watershed. Um, a key part of this is to really engage the, when we say, well, you know, to get participation, particularly from the agricultural community, that's a, that's a pretty important point that comes through the National Water Quality Initiative through NRCS. And so um, getting increasing participation from, from private landowners who are the farmers uh, could increase some of that information. If anybody else has anything to add to that or, or any other questions? Hi, Michael, I have a question. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, it's Kyra Jacobs from EPA Region 1 in Boston. And great presentation. I learned so much, even though I've been a part of this project for a couple of years. I just, and we may get into this later, and I apologize, I didn't memorize the um, outline that, um, that was presented earlier, which was also fantastic. I was just curious, you know, just earlier today, some of us um, who were on this call were part of the uh, Connecticut NRCS State Technical Committee meeting. And Chris Martin from Connecticut Deep was talking about the State Forest Action Plan. So I was wondering if maybe Regional Water Authority, I know was on the call, if other folks, if, you know, we were talking about private, we're talking about farmers who have forested lands. And one of the things Chris Martin said is that, you know, that's an important component. Sometimes we focus on the ag part of farmers, but we forget or don't focus as much on their forested land. So I was just trying to think about how we can maybe work with those farmers to help protect their land and through easements, perhaps. I know it's complicated that, you know, some of the um, dollars from NRCS are targeted more towards their EQIP program. So I was just thinking out loud about, you know, when you look at your maps and you think about the land that needs to be conserved, how can we best work with the farmers in the watershed to help them protect their, their forest and land? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, some of our tributaries and maybe even the main stem are pretty close to or pass through agricultural, like through a farm. And, you know, so rip riparian buffers are, are key to buffering any sort of land use um, against that water quality. And uh, yeah, I would, I, I appreciate you bringing up the State Forest Action Plan. That's not something I've heard about in a long time. And so to refresh my memory and make sure that we really attend to that and, and, and try to integrate water quality, you know, active participation from our agricultural community in the watershed and, and a large planning level initiatives like this that can that it can ultimately protect the water. So it's, it's, it's important to prior keep that in the front of our heads, um, that it's yes, not, not just about the fields, it's about all the land that they're, they're managing. Yeah. Right, and just uh, unfortunately, there are very few benefits to COVID, but one of them is that the um, US Forest, I'm sorry, yes, the US Forest Service has extended the due date for the forest action plans. So it's my understanding that the drafts will be due I guess probably September 30th or sometime in the next month. And then I believe- September 31st. Oh, hi, Carl. <laughs> but sorry, that, that's the final. Um, but what Chris was saying after you jumped off the call today, I think Carl is that he was saying the draft would be available, I think in the next few weeks, but that the Forest Service has extended the deadline for the final forest action plans till the end of, like you said, December 31st. So the- we have an expert, Carl Michael. We have Carl Honkin from the U.S. Forest Service. I didn't know he was on, and this is his expertise. So I'll let him jump in. And it's my understanding the timing is also excellent because the forest action plans are only updated every 10 years, Carl? Yes, Kyra, that's right. Uh, if, I have a couple of questions, if, if I could just jump in for a second. 
Uh, I joined the call a little bit late, so sorry if I missed the introductions, but this was a great overview of the watershed. And um, my two questions are, and I'm sorry if I missed this at the beginning of the talk, but um, what is the percentage of groundwater versus surface water supply in, the, in this watershed? Uh, Eric, do you have that number or is somebody from RW? I, I don't Yeah, I, I we, we actually had that discussion. Uh, Michael yeah. and I were talking about that. We were trying to get that number and I don't know that we have that from Regional Water Authority, um, either in terms of population served or of uh, land area you know, served by, by groundwater versus surface water. But I don't know if uh, either Chris or if Ron's on the, on the call. Um, we, we don't have that number. Um, we do know um, a large portion of the North Brantford watershed is not on RWA public water supply. So there are private wells. Um, there are some community wells um, with the multifamily housing up in Northford. Um, but I mean, we could kind of give you our, the area that we cover for our distribution map, if that would be helpful. Sure, sure. I was just trying to get a feel for, you know, potential impacts from surface versus groundwater uh, withdrawals, that's all. Um, my second question- Wait, uh, uh, Carl, before you, before you answer, sorry. this is Chris Sullivan. I just wanted to chime in on that too. Yeah. Um, when we were doing some of the mapping for this, there actually wasn't any uh, aquifer protection areas from DEP in the watershed. So that's the larger groundwater system. So um, like Ron mentioned, it'd be smaller scale residential uh, wells that would be the groundwater. So, you know, just based on not having the larger aquifer protection areas, I would say that the percentage is probably more heavily skewed towards surface water, um, but I'm only speculating on that. Okay, thanks. Uh, my last question, I understand from your, again, great overview that it's a, about 41% forested, but the vast majority of that 41%, 37.5 is deciduous forest. And I would, uh, ask that you do some type of an analysis to look at the potential threats to that forest ecosystem, whether it's in, in the forest health arena, whether it's uh, insect infestation, such as gypsy moth or, or disease vectors that could impact that, because I know that uh, Connecticut's been hit pretty hard by some of these uh, pests, and that could definitely uh, impact future water supplies. So if you could look into that and if you need some help getting that data, uh, I could certainly lend a hand. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's that's great. That's a good comment. Um, I know areas have been devastated over the past you know few years by you know some of these these insects and pests. So yeah, that would be. Um, I don't know, Ron, if you guys have that kind of information, you know, for at least the regional water authority you know, land, but um, it, it certainly is a, I think a big issue. I can get you in contact with our forester. Alex Stan Mandola. Yep. I think uh, we just recently, probably the past couple of years, hired a invasive species specialist. Um, and our uh, forestry practices have actually are now looking at the impact of uh, introducing uh, invasive species, barberry and um, still grass. So we do are we are very concerned with that. Um, yep. And I think there's a there's a key link to climate change too in terms of you know how are those um, issues you know shifting or migrating and you know affecting um, you know some of the large you know, forest forest land and in the in the region. Yes, we've we've had infestations out at, um, in West Haven and Orange at our Maltby Lakes where we had to clear cut the the trees. Yep. Yeah, non-native invasive species was on my list of questions too, but I didn't want to dominate the conversation. So thanks for mentioning that. Well, thank you to you both for bringing up. Um, I mean, I think sometimes we think of forests as sort of a static system that just sort of stay there and do their job, but they're they're quite dynamic as we're seeing lately. And certainly could be a lot of changes, especially in, in you know, 20 to 50 years with uh, invasive species or um, you know, more severe storms where our, our forests and the composition could really significantly change. So uh, it's a good thing to, to keep in mind as we go forward. So thank you. I, I have a question. I know the the other three um, 
management plans that I've been involved with um, really didn't go into a lot of detail about the zoning regulations. And I think um, zoning regulations are definitely have a huge impact on the water quality. And I'm wondering if, if that could be brought up to get um, North Brantford, East Haven, and Brantford's uh, zoning regulations, especially stormwater management yep. to speed. Um, I know, and you know, a good example is Hamden. Hamden uh, has some very good stormwater management uh, requirements. Yeah, actually, Ron, that's a that's a good point. Um, right now, with the MS4 permit, you know, towns are in the process, so they're going to have to update their regs if they haven't updated them, you know, recently in terms of stormwater management. And uh, you know, we recently finished an update of the Niantic River Watershed Plan, and a, a big part of that was just kind of doing a consistency review of the you know four or so major towns there, um, and their their zoning regs and some of the policies, and they were all over. the place you know a few of the towns had really progressive uh, updated in, uh, regulations and others were you know 20 year more years old era regulations so I think that's something that we can focus on and uh, even if it's not you know a, a full-blown review at least identify some of those inconsistencies and have it as an action you know, an action item to you know to to thoroughly review and uh, update you know select number of regulations yeah and I, I think along with that is the, the enforcement issues, you know, is, is there town staff, um, is there adequate town staff? I mean, North, North Brantford, we work quite well together with them, but um, there's probably other, there's probably another town in the watershed that we have very little, uh, I would say there, there's kind of enforcement issues. Yep. That we that that probably need to be deal, dealt with, right, right, yeah. So I mean, this is time to bring up those issues, and I think um, you know, working together, kind of in this uh, cooperative watershed planning mode, you know, versus a uh, maybe an adversarial, you know, enforcement compliance mode is uh, is the way to do it. All right. Are there uh, yeah. other questions? Yeah. Hi, Eric and Michael. It's Denise. And one of the things I want to bring up is the quantity issue. And, you know, a lot of times when we're dealing with impaired watersheds, we talk about quantity from a flooding stormwater management perspective. And we do want to do more infiltration, but we, we want to do more infiltration, not necessarily for groundwater reasons, but or for supply reasons, but more for um, controlling the flooding going downstream. Um, being on a water, public drinking water supply, the water quantity issue is huge. Um, the impacts, uh, and as well as we, I think we haven't done a really good job um, looking at the impacts of water quality from a quantity perspective. So when we have having drought, for example, I know that we're seeing more uh, algal blooms in streams and whatever uh, during periods of drought. So. Um, there's challenges there. So I just want to think about looking at the quantity issues. And as you know, the state water plan did a lot of work that you may be able to draw on. They've got some, you know, they looked at every single basin in the state. So I want to look at that in terms of current conditions. Um, and yeah. and, so, and so, so I guess I'd look at that. And then I know, for example, you know, Carl brought up the issue of, you know, really looking at the forests and how important they are, not just about pro providing clean water, but providing water. <laughs> so the, right. whole, the whole, again, that whole idea of the quantity of water. So I wanted to bring that up. And the uh, Connecticut Council is in the process of updating the stormwater and the erosion sediment control guides for the state. And uh, Mike Dietz from UConn um, wanted to make sure that everybody is using uh, the most up-to-date uh, data in terms of rainfall and precipitation. And I know you're kind of on top of that, but I think yep. just making sure and checking in with with uh, Mike that whatever we're using to, as a predictive model is uh, what they're recommending out of UConn. 
So I'm just putting that in there, and I know you're probably already doing that, but I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page because we are going to be saying that across the state. Um, like we we need people to be looking at, you know, rainfall data that's relevant to now, and you know, even from the perspective of looking at predictions within the the public drinking water supply, um, we're, we need to be looking at the newer rainfall data. And then just the last thing I wanted to mention on, on climate, um, and I thought, I love the fact that you talked about looking at that and uh, primarily from an adaptation and resiliency perspective, but I also want to make sure we put in the fact that there's there's mitigation that happens from climate change, particularly with forests, um, wetlands, and some other things, so that they mitigate climate change or can mitigate the impacts, not necessarily just from an adaptive perspective, mm -hmm. but if we're talking about reducing heat, we don't want to create heat islands. So those, those are the types of things we need to be talking about. And there's a lot of discussion, as you know, with the governor's council on, on climate change, but how that impacts. And then I just have one question that kind of goes along with that. And is that our, in the lower end of the watershed, are you looking at salt water, potential for salt water intrusion? and sea level rise is that something that is already being looked at in any in any of the predictive models or is that below our study area yeah i, I think that area is technically part of the study area you know the um the estuary portion is within the area the embayment itself is kind of outside the uh, study area um i think it's worth bringing up i mean we probably can't get into that in a lot of detail but i think if we have some uh, recommendations relative to climate change and the coastal area, you know, coastal portion of the watershed, the estuary portion, I think that's all fair game. And I, I, so I think we want to capture those issues to the extent that we can, you know, in, in, in the project scope and budget. But, um, but yeah, I, I do want to, I, I think we were, we haven't reviewed the, you know, the kind of the coastal resilience planning documents in detail. I know a lot of those focus on Sort of your traditional adaptation, you know, sea level rise, storm surge, flooding, but um, to capture other issues related to water quality, like like saltwater intrusion, you know, or rising groundwaters in coastal areas. I think that all of that, I think, are issues we should probably at least um, take a look at and figure out whether or not we want to include them in any detail in, in this plan. So one of the things, of course, they're looking at, like at the Cape and on Long Island, is saltwater of intrusion yep. are there septic systems that are impacted right so right. Those, those are the types of things that i was i was looking at i you know i know we're, i'm not looking so much at the not that we wouldn't mention the flood protection a little bit just like you said in passing yep. but it's being handled elsewhere but i'm really looking at that water quality and or habitat piece that yeah. kind of goes in with our planning so, so I just wanted those, to, yeah I, I just i just wanted to bring that up then that's a good point i think you know rising groundwater in coastal areas and impacts on areas that already have you know older septic systems you know I, I i forget now if there's a lot of that sewer down there or if we do have some septic in the area but um we have some maps of that that we'll show in a few minutes too thank you any other questions eric i will i will get out of my screen okay and let you I'll take, I'll take, take over, over again controls. And I will do the same thing and just kind of skip forward. I want to make sure I. Uh... Let's see if I can do this. I'm going to try to. I'm going to get to the right place in the presentation, then I'll pick it back up. Okay. I will share my screen again. Hopefully this works. Okay. Let's um, talk about some water quality issues then. All right. So um, you know, I'm just going to quickly run through some of the you know the water quality impairments and some of the water quality issues in the, the watershed, and you know kind of organizing them based on surface water and groundwater. Um, 
you know, for surface water in the watershed, the first um, point I want to make is, you know, we have issues with fecal indicator bacteria, and uh, this is, you know, this affects the ability to use, um, you know, segments of the of the farm river itself uh, for contact recreation, you know, for swimming and that kind of thing. Um, nutrients, um, including both uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, are also, uh, you know, a concern and a, a you know a source and cause of um, you know, some of the issues in terms of the reservoir water quality and uh, you know kind of eutrophication processes al you know, algae blooms again during you know kind of warm periods of low flow and then low dissolved oxygen in uh, in you know, portions of the reservoirs um, aquatic life use support you know is is definitely impacted in uh, the farm river and some of its tributaries you know bait because of um, you know low flows and and some of the you know the water quality itself and then, of course, all of this, you know, the nutrients and upstream water quality impacts the estuary and then eventually Long Island Sound. So, you know, those are the kind of the major surface water issues in the watershed. Um, on the groundwater side, you know, we talked about the fact that, you know, groundwater does serve um, both smaller public and private water supply wells. And again, the issues there are really, you know, kind of your synthetic organic chemicals, your hydrocarbons, um, you know, potential spills from you know, roads and highways, and then some of the, the kind of contaminants that impact, um, you know, groundwater quality in terms, you know, from some of the, you know, winter de-icing uh, practices, sodium chloride, um, the nitrate from fertilizers, and, and of course, you know, pathogens from things like failing septic and, um, you know, that can impact uh, groundwater quality. So. In terms of the uh, the indicator bacteria, you know the um, what we're talking about really is uh, you know coliform bacteria. It's present in uh, you know the feces of animals and humans. Um, you know, again, this is in sort of an indicator bacteria, so it doesn't typically cause illness, but when it's present in water, it indicates that, that there could be other um, you know disease-causing organisms or uh, pathogens in the water. So it's kind of a, a red flag. And uh, we look at E. coli and enter enterococci, uh, depending on, on whether we're in freshwater or saltwater. Um, and then, of course, you know the, the sources of these are either sewage contamination, you know, feeling septic, animal waste from some of the agricultural operations, um, and of course, the urban runoff, ag runoff, um, and some of these other sources. So, these are the kind of issues that have impacted you know segments of the Farm River. Um, and its tributaries in, in the watershed. Uh, on the nutrient side, you know, again, we're talking about phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, you know, both of these are, of course, essential for, um, you know, for life. But the problem, you know, becomes when we have too much of these nutrients. And it, it can lead to, uh, again, kind of fueling this growth of nuisance aquatic plants, um, either, you know, nuisance or actual harmful al algae blooms. Um, and again, when these, these plants, they die off, they consume oxygen, leads to dead zones in some of our, you know, more stagnant impoundments. Um, and these affect, you know, water supply, you know, whether it's the quality of the, of the supply, you know, the intake issues, um, and, and downstream in the, in the estuary, potentially, you know, re reduced eelgrass and some of the est estuary species. Um, again, sources of nutrients commonly include failing septic systems, um, stormwater runoff, both from agriculture and, and urbanized areas, uh, erosion and sedimentation, construction sites, you know, where you have nutrients attached to sediment particles, and then your, uh, of course, atmospheric uh, deposition that's falling out of the, out of the sky itself. Um, this map here shows the, the water quality impairment. So when we refer to a, a, an impairment, this just means that water bodies that, based on, on some sampling or monitoring data, uh, are shown that they don't meet the, the water quality criteria established by the state, you know, for a designated use. So whether that use is recreation or aquatic life use support or shell fishing, you know, there's some minimum criteria that are established. And when, when your sample results are above that criteria, that's when you um, have these identified impairments that, that DEEP maintains every few years. So in the in the Farm River, um, you know, I'm going to talk about these first two segments. The Farm River 01 and 02 segments include the uh, the lower segment down here in sort of the East Haven uh, part of the watershed. This is a, a an aquatic life um, impairment and also a recreation impairment because of bacteria. Um, Farm River 03B, 
which is, which is a little bit farther up in the watershed. That's this upper portion here. Again, this is an aquatic life use impairment. And again, it, uh, you know, low flow is generally the, the, the cause and, and source of, um, of the issues in that segment of the river. Um, Gulf Brook. Gulf Brook comes, you know, again, off of uh, Tatucket Mountain um, up in the north part of the watershed. This is also a similar, you know, another aquatic life uh, flow, you know, flow issue. Burr's Brook, a little bit farther down in the mid, mid portion of the watershed. Um, we've got, again, got an issue with aquatic life support due to, um, as listed in the, by the D, by DEP, uh, sodium and turbidity have been sort of identified as a, as a cause there. And then we also have um, a few new impairments that have been identified in the draft um, 2020 integrated water quality report. The rest of these have been based on 2018 uh, report. Uh, Deep updates that every two years and just recently issued the draft 2020 report. And they actually added the two estuary um, or the estuary segment and also sort of the embayment segment um, at the very mouth of the watershed. And these are also aquatic life use support uh, impairments uh, because of um, nutrients and dissolved oxygen, you know, low, low DO. So it looks like, you know, some of the uh, impairments have been expanded further south into those, you know, more coastal areas. Um, back in 2012, there was um, what's referred to as a total maximum daily load or a TMDL developed statewide for a number of watersheds throughout the state for uh, bacteria, fecal indicator bacteria and for recreation and shellfish primarily. Um, the TMDL for the Farm River has the specific pollutant load reduction goals. So, you know, the idea is you need to reduce the levels of bacteria to a certain amount in order for uh, these water segments, water body segments to meet those water quality criteria to support recreation, for example. And in that Farm River all one segment, you know, down down here in the, in the south, um, we have some pretty high, uh, you know, either geometric mean or single sample reduction goals. You know, 90, 90 plus percent is a high goal. And this is based on data that was collected back in 2003, 04, and then 06 to 09. So maybe about 40 samples or so over that time period. But clearly it shows that, you know, there's um, you know, many exceedances of the bacteria standards and you know, there's some major reductions to be uh, achieved there. And similarly with that Farm River 02 segment, that's the, the smaller segment right in the middle of the watershed. Again, similar reductions, not quite as high um, this happens to be based on literally like three samples. So again, the data is not extremely robust. And, um, you know, I think, you know, what it points to is that bacteria one is very ubiquitous and tends to be highly variable in most places, but it is an issue clearly. Um, and the last thing, you know, point out back in 2012 was that the O3 segment up here in the north uh, was, not, was not assessed at that time. So we don't really have that data. Right? Um, Again, this is a good sort of, it's an older document. It does sort of underscore some of the issues. Um, we're gonna be relying on really that, that 2018, you know, 2020, um, you know, integrated water quality report uh, that D publishes uh, as more, more recent data. And of course, we do have that USGS gauge. I believe they're doing some bacteria monitoring there. So that'll really be the, the best and the most current data. Um, you know, as, as Chris mentioned, you know, there has been quite a bit of water quality monitoring done by, by DEEP as part of their, their programs, um, you know, that mentioned the bacteria, TMDL. Uh, Chris mentioned, you know, some of the historic background vertebrate and fisheries data that we do have in the watershed. And then really, you know, kind of the gem right now is this new data that USGS is collecting, which will really help us with some of the pollutant modeling and to get a better sense for, um, you know, what are those actual loads at least in the, the middle of our watershed. Uh, Save the Sound has been involved in what's called the Unified Water Study, and they've been monitoring um, a lot of the embayments in, uh, in the Connecticut coast and Long Island Sound, I'm looking at you know, really focused on nitrogen and nutrients um, in some of these embayments. So we do have the benefit, I believe, of some of that, that data for the, uh, the coastal areas. And uh, again, Chris mentioned the stream walks with Save the Sound and then some of that benthic monitoring by volunteers. So, um, you know, a, a decent, you know, set of water quality monitoring historically and some good new data coming in will really help. 
Um, Mike, I'm just going to hand it back over to you quickly, and you can just kind of finish up these these slides from here on out. All right. Are we seeing that? Yep. Okay. Great. I tried to plan ahead a little bit that time. Okay, so we're just gonna, we, we probably could have reviewed this a little bit earlier since we've been talking so much about the uh, drinking water resources and, and how the, how it, uh, how it, oh, not quite scrolling through now. Oh, there we go. Uh, so yeah, so just trying to, this, this might've been a little bit helpful earlier in terms of that blue area are, are the local drainage basins that I mentioned before are the public watershed supply watersheds. And so those, those bluish areas are sending their water into those, those reservoirs. Um, the light pink and the dark pink are just interesting areas to be aware of. These are coarse and fine stratified drift, which are basically our groundwater reservoirs. Um, these are not mapped as state designated aquifer protection areas. Uh, so that's a different uh, type of area. Uh, you could see those on uh, Connecticut Environmental Conditions Online, CT Echo. Uh, they have their, all the APAs mapped on their interactive viewer. But it's important to recognize where these stratified drift deposits are and their potential for, for uh, being a groundwater reservoir or for at least uh, being recharge areas. And so if, if we have a lot of development over stratified drift, you know, we are essentially um, compromising uh, that recharge or possibly even the water quality of that, of that reservoir, the groundwater reservoir. Um, so some of this information has come from uh, Regional Water Authority's uh, presentation last year or so, but just to kind of summarize some of their points. Uh, about 9% of the watershed is owned by the Regional Water Authority for the source water protection. Uh, they have two reservoirs of Lake Saltonstall and Lake Gallard. Lake Gallard is a little bit outside of our area, but certainly uh, influential. And then 10 known diversions in the watershed of uh, surface water for drinking water supplies. And as we said before, there are groundwater resources that we can, we can probably do our best to discuss and summarize and somehow get a handle on um, not only the private wells of which there are many, but also um, maybe community wells and things of that nature and, and recommendations related to that. Uh, but similarly underground, we have our septic uh, and our sewer systems. Uh, dark green is our existing areas, uh, and then we have proposed areas as well in the light green. There are no wastewater treatment facilities in the watershed, so the existing sewer service and any proposed is going to uh, wastewater treatment facilities in Brantford and New Haven. Um, you can see how the existing sewer service uh, seems to kind of wrap right around the uh, the reservoir, especially Lake Saltonstall. So that's a, uh, you know, possibly a good mitigation effort to protect uh, drinking water is having a sewered, a large sewered area and those highly developed areas having highly sewered as well. And again, this, this area of Fox and Road to me seems to be a little bit of where things split in the watershed on being a little, uh, having more, infrastructure, more development, and then uh, more exurban or more rural as we go north. And so that, that's just to me a bit, not quite halfway, but it's a bit of the dividing line on some of the, the land use and the infrastructure. Uh, speaking of infrastructure, so we have our stormwater systems throughout. I think what we have here is Brantford, North Brantford. Um, yeah, so we don't have East Haven on here, but they're all MS4 towns. Um, they're all required to be, they're all in year four of their permit, I believe, and the DOT, which uh, has jurisdiction over state roads 
and the interstate, I think, uh, is in year two of their general permit. So a lot of our uh, field assessments that we will get to this fall will be focused on some of these areas where there are, uh, you know, direct discharges or some water systems that uh, don't have any sort of mitigating resources as Denise was mentioning before. Um, all the all the permittees on the MS4 are uh, guided by the six minimum control measures. And that was sort of the, a little part B of the water quality. So I don't know what sort of questions you all have uh, for Eric or me on on this section. N nothing in the chat window, Mike. Okay. So actually I have a question and maybe Ron will be able to answer it, but I wanted to make sure I had this correct. Um, it indicated that 10% of RWA supply comes from salt and stall and 60% comes from Gillard. And although Gillard is outside of the Farm River watershed, you transfer water from the Farm River watershed to Gillard. So basically what I'm hearing or what I thought was there is that 70% of RWA supply um, is impacted by the Farm River. It, would, is that a correct assumption? Um, <clears throat> I would say the, the Farm River portion that is diverted to Lake Gillard is probably minimal. Um, Lake Gillard, we actually collect water from Lake Hammonasset and, and Lake Monongatuck, and that is brought to Lake Gillard. So the natural the Farm River watershed portion that feeds Lake Gillard, and it's through a diversion, which we have uh, the ability to, to open and close the diversions based on water quality and quantity is rather small compared to um, the diversions coming from the West. And so from that said, you can still do that though if you you need to right so as an emergency yes. supply it's it's we the connection is there and you do utilize we it. we do utilize it and we take water from the farm river to gillard and also from the farm river to lake salt i i get the, the point being is that i understand that the supply itself is coming from someplace else but the impact of the supply i mean if there's contamination coming into the farm or from the farm that's then going into gillard it doesn't if even if you put i know this salute i know there's dilution but <laughs> we're still impacting that resource if we have yes. contamination coming out of the farm it's absolutely um i mean we do have some control if we know you know if, if there's a you know, a thunderstorm or, you know, a hurricane coming up, we would actually close diversions. Um, if we, you know, if we get into the summer with, you know, problems with the water quality, we, we can shut the diversions. So we do have somewhat of a control over the water quality that's going in. But okay, yeah, thanks. It's, it, it, I think it's, a, it's, it's interesting to understand and when you have a water supply that has a series of very small reservoirs, I just wanted people to have a feel for that because I know we had a similar system, <coughs> excuse me, um, that Aquarian has a similar system in, in uh, Greenwich and Stanford that all is intertwined with a lot of uh, small reservoirs. So when I was seeing this, I'm like, oh, people probably don't understand how this works. And yeah. it's really interesting. I would, uh salt and stall is highly impacted based on the quality of the water in the farm river compared to lake gillard all right thanks with lake gillard the watersheds that we own to the west of that we own a significant amount of property so we're in you know probably 30 probably 60 percent of lake hamanassa watershed is protected and probably 70% of Lake Nuncatuck watersheds protected. So those feed actually high quality water into Lake Gillard. And we own probably 90% of the direct watershed from Lake Gillard. So the, the Farm River has a, a significant more water quality impact to Lake Salt and Salt. 
And does Lake Saltonstall serve a particular population um, so that when you're taking water out of there to serve the public, the way this, the distribution system is, you can't necessarily serve them through your other systems? Um, we have been, we've been combining our service systems so we can, for the most part, we can supply Lake Saltonstall with water from Lake Allard. So if, if Lake Saltonstall, we, we've, had, we've made improvements to the distribution system and interconnections through the different service areas. So if Lake Saltonstall does go down, we can supply that through Lake Allard. But I guess what I was saying though, is though, even though as a source of supply, it's 10%, you have a distribution system and a treatment plant coming out of salt and stall that serves a certain area that's not served any by any place else. Um, Your distribution system. The, the distributions, it's during normal operations, there is, an, there is a service area for Lake Salt and Stall, but that service area could also be served by Lake Gillard. Okay, so it doesn't have to go, the water doesn't have to go into salt and stall. You can just take over. No, it goes through um, pipes. <laughs> yeah, we have a. We would turn pumps and valves on and off and push water the other way. All right. Thank you. Excuse me. I have a question. Um, this is Paul Solis with USG. Um, I know it was mentioned earlier that um, we. You go ahead and we grab samples, uh, grab samples every month uh, for water quality. Um, I just want to know any of the other water quality samples that are being collected, are those monthly as well? Uh, this is Chris Sullivan. So there's, I don't know if Deep is doing anything at their locations on any sort of regular basis. Um, I don't believe they are. The last time I spoke with them, um, a couple months ago that there was, uh, they weren't doing any monitoring this summer. I don't know if that changed. I know Chris Malik's on the call. I don't know if he has a better answer for that. Um, but um, for some of the other places, I, I, don't, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I can't say that I have an answer to that, but I could, I could get back to Chris. And yeah, that would be good. Thanks. Yeah, and Paul, I can certainly uh, relay that information to you. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to know if there's any um water quality data that I could look back on from before um, we started collecting samples in uh, February, I believe, um, if there's any previous data to that. I mean, I could look and see, I know I know that there wasn't any since in between like February and you know now, I don't think there was anything, but maybe pre-February there has been, I can look. Uh, okay. Chris, Chris Malik and I can communicate and try to get anything for you. Thank you. Sure thing. Duh. We had a reservoir and stream monitoring program up until about, um, I can get you that report. Um, after that, due to a lot of unforeseen circumstances, we kind of cut back on our water quality monitoring, but we mm -hmm. have uh, some data up till 2010, and I believe that has recently started up again. So I can get you that data. Okay, I'll go ahead and put my email in the chat. Um, if you have anything to send me, but that's fine. Thank you. Are there any, any, other, uh, other any other questions? Oh, sorry, Eric. That's okay. Yeah. All right. Michael, do you want to just continue on the slides? I can I can pick up. I we only have one or two more left, so yeah. rather than me trying to transition back. Yeah, it makes sense. All right. So um, what I outlined here is the our, our project schedule and some of the next steps. Um, so basically, we're going to summarize this meeting. We're going to put together some notes and some of the you know key highlights and some of the questions that we got and get that out to the uh, you know the steering committee and the group. Um, we also uh, discussed having a doing a stakeholder survey and kind of following up this meeting um, you know with the you know with the stakeholders the steering committee some other folks and asking them a few questions I think we were thinking of doing like an online um, type survey 
uh, to you know, kind of drill down on some of the issues a little bit more or for those people that couldn't be you know, here tonight. So uh, I guess we'll work with Chris on, on that and figure out what the best um, you know, approach is, software to use, uh, and try to do that as seamlessly as possible. Um, that would be in the September timeframe. Um, I believe, Chris, you and uh, Save the Sound are trying to complete the streamwalks, you know, sort of on that, that time frame, September um, time frame. And then we're going to be going out, you know, Fuss and O'Neill combined with, uh, you know, Chris and Save the Sound to do some of those other visual fuel assessments um, around the October time frame. And then we're looking at doing some pollutant load modeling by the end of the calendar year. And then really looking towards the first half of next year to get into um, you know, developing plan recommendations, putting together the actual watershed plan, and then uh, shooting for a public presentation uh, next July. So overall about a, you know, a year long time frame um, is what we have scheduled. So um, I think that is it for uh, schedule. And, and lastly, if there are any other you know questions or, or comments, um, like if you want to just flip to the last slide, we just have Chris's contact information here. So. Um, now, Chris, you want to just wrap it up and yeah, I was just gonna. There's there was a chat question that came in about East Haven and their MS4 data and stormwater system, and I, I responded to it. It was just data that we couldn't obtain in time for this presentation. I'm still in communication with municipal staff in East Haven. Um, their GIS people had left, and they don't know where the data files ended up going when those people left the uh, uh, municipality. So. We're still working on that, and once we get it, we'll include that information in the mapping. Um, and uh, to Eric and Michael, there's another question about uh, giving suggestions for zoning regulation changes. I know that came up earlier as something to look into. I don't know if that's uh, a category that would be included to make suggestions for those changes. Yeah, sure. I, th I think um, you know we can certainly look at at some of the regulations relative to you know stormwater clearly. Um, there could be even some other resource protection, you know, type of um, issues in the regs. Uh, impervious cover is, is another one that uh, it, it doesn't take much to look at some of the regulations and realize how out of date some of them can be. So that's typically pretty low hanging fruit. We could, uh, you know, offer some suggestions, you know, some recommendations right right in the plan itself. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's we've we've done that kind of work for other watershed plans, and I think it it really um, highlights sort of the the variable nature of a lot of town town regs, even within a given watershed. Thanks. All right. If there's any, no other questions, um, you know, my my contact information is on the screen right now. Uh, I'm primarily working from home. Emails are the best way to communicate with me. Um, but if questions come up after this meeting, definitely reach out to me. I'm you know, connecting with Eric and Michael pretty regularly. I can also connect with other folks that have been working on this project from the stakeholder group and the steering committee to get to this point. Um, so I can kind of be a, a point person to share information back and forth, whether it's uh, the report that Ron was talking about with that data or uh, as Chris Malik and I get some more information on what DEEP is doing. Um, so definitely communicate with me. We will, um, as Eric mentioned, we're gonna, there's gonna be a summary of this meeting some a discussion of that and then we'll move into the next steps and you know, collecting some more data um, but if there's any other questions now would be a t good time to ask or definitely shoot off an email to me in the near future and uh, I will get answers for anybody that's interested um, hi so Chris it's Kyra yeah, yeah sure Kyra go ahead so I'm just thinking out loud I recall back in the dark ages when we met in person we um <laughs> talked about one of the reasons we wanted to do this meeting in the evening was so that we could engage some of the local folks and I feel like I don't have a good enough sense to know how many people on the call are actually uh, residents of the watershed I mean I know some of you including you Chris you live in the watershed and you work in the watershed so to speak but uh, not to put Carl on the spot but Carl lives in a community in Maine where we have a project called the Salmon Falls Watershed Collaborative and I had mentioned it to you guys in person in North Brantford at one point how one of the things we struggle with after 10 years of having a watershed collaborative is how to engage local folks and maybe it's a poor question to ask during this time when you know if it wasn't COVID or homeschooling your kids or 
Um, you lost a lot of trees in the storm a week and a half ago and you just got your power back. I guess the average person probably isn't thinking, oh, I'd like to uh, listen in on the Farm River watershed meeting this evening because I have nothing else to do. So, so maybe it's just a challenging time for everyone. But I remember just coming up with some fun ideas back then, um, again, when we weren't on Zoom every day for five hours a day. But talking about that brewery, I, I forget the name of the brewery in North Ranford. Stewards of the Land. Thank you. I always forget the name of it. I was looking at all those maps online. I thought, I'm so grateful that I used to get lost going to the meetings at the North Ranford Town Hall because at least I can picture what a beautiful place this watershed is and I I just wanted to say to the group for those of you who might live in the watershed or know folks that live in the watershed if you can just think about how to engage people you know even during this challenge in time so that people will be invested especially the people that you know one of the things we struggle with in the drinking water community is oftentimes the watershed is located in a place where people don't drink the water so it's hard to say to someone who lives in a place where they're drinking from a private well, oh, it's really great and be really important for you to help protect South Central Connecticut Regional Water Authority's water supply because people in the greater New Haven area are drinking it even if you're not. So, you know, just somehow creating a compelling message that it's, it's important to protect water quality and quantity as was pointed out this evening and if I had if I had the the magic bullet for the answers to those questions, I would um, be able to retire. But <laughs> but I don't, so I'll keep working on protecting drinking water in New England because I don't know what the answer is. But but great job, everyone! I'm really impressed. Thank you Thanks. for the insights, Kara. And just I don't know if you were on at the very beginning, but this is being um a live stream through the local community access tv and i believe they're going to replay it also so hopefully right. that'll help us connect with folks in the watershed so one other yes yeah, so i guess start up local businesses anybody yeah. wants to get involved in the effort one other quick thought um along those lines is maybe i don't this isn't that environmentally friendly but if flyers could be made up um, we do have a lot of farm stands in north branford so maybe flyers or some kind of business card, something small could be placed at the farm stands or even at Stewards of the Land Brewery, which Dave Sargent mentioned is open. So at least visitors who are going to those farm stands could pick up information um, and be directed either to a website or to Totucka TV even to watch this um, filming. It's just a thought. Well, that's a, that's a really good suggestion, Carrie. Um, I can put it on my list to try to work on a flyer. <laughs> well, and uh, Chris, Chris, this is Chris yes. Collins. Hey, Chris, how are you? I'm good. I just want to say we local folks are here. I've been a member of the Friends of the Farm River Estuary since 2004 when we became a nonprofit. And for all those years, we've been doing various projects, supporting the river, doing cleanups, doing educational activities. And we're still here after all these years um, and are still interested in knowing what's happened and so pleased that there's so much attention. We've done so many little studies ourselves. We're now working with Save the Sound on the Unified Water um, Study. And we're not as big as we were at the beginning, but we're here and we're interested and there are a number of us. So we're glad to be part of your group. Awesome. Thank you, Christine. You're welcome. Yeah, I wanted to uh, add to my, my federal sister, Kyra, said about public input. Um, I'm glad to hear that there's a stakeholder survey component. And one of the things I would really like to see you ask people that own land in the watershed is to ask them, why do I own this land? What are my objectives for owning this land? And what happens to this land that I own when uh, I pass on uh, as it protected in my in my uh, next generation's thoughts and so forth, because here at the Forest Service, our mantra is to keep forests as forests. And if you change that land ownership, there's a potential to, to change the use of that land. So 
having that stakeholder input, I think, would be would be critical. And the last thing that I'll I'll add is that hang on, my phone's ringing. Um, I'm really excited that you're doing these uh, these stream walks and some field assessments. And and selfishly, I would enjoy joining you on one of them if that's even possible with appropriate PPE on and so forth. Um, as a forester, and I'm sure you can all relate to this, I haven't been in the woods more than twice since March. So a chance to get out in the field and see what these resources are all about, I, I would welcome. So if that's appropriate, Chris or whomever, please let me know. Thanks. Thank you for offering, Carl. We'll see if we can figure something out. Chris, I wanted to say my name's Linda Cummings and I'm part of the Friends of Farm River as well as Chris Collins. Um, I, I live right here on the estuary edge of the, of the river. Um, and I love it. And I kayak here and canoe a lot, do a lot of photography here. Chris and I have been talking about, you know, what kind of educational programs we could have um, to, you know, help local residents really understand the nature of the estuary and how important it is in terms of the whole uh, watershed. But we, we really never got anything off the ground at, at you know, to, the, to my knowledge, I don't know if there's anything or anyone that's, um, you know, doing something that could really, you know, help educate the community. I, I think that's a great suggestion. Maybe we can, uh, part of this activity can bring some people together and put something together in terms of an educational component. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know something off the top of my head, but uh, it seems like a lot of the people on this call are interested in protecting the farm river. And so you know, maybe a smaller group uh, gets together from the stakeholder group and, you know, brainstorm some, some ideas. Uh, so I can try to coordinate that amongst interested folks. Okay. Yeah, early on in the discussion, we started talking about that. And then obviously we had to concentrate on getting the watershed planning done. Um, but one of the things we had talked about is getting a program together that kind of talked about source to sound. So people understand that this river, you know, starts as public drinking water supply, but obviously is part of the lifeblood for Long Island Sound and the estuary. So how do we talk, how do we basically do, a, you know, and we were talking at that time, pre-COVID, of tours starting with the upper part of the watershed and working mm -hmm. down. But certainly we could probably do so, cert, some things like that virtually as well. So do a, a couple of tours of the upper watershed and whatever. And then I'm also working with Sue Quincy at DEEP on Project WET, which is water education for teachers. And Sue has been doing some great work with virtual workshops. And um, I'm a facilitator for DEP with Project WET, as well as working with Sue. And we could certainly, if the municipalities and the schools within that, within that wanted to have teacher training, we could get those you know, out fairly quickly. Um, and I'm sure uh, give the teachers some materials they can use virtually as well as in the classroom, depending on what they're going to be doing. And as you know, teachers are really, if they, if the schools are going to be open, one of the things they're promoting is getting the kids outside more often. So that's one of the things we could look at is, okay, if, you're, if the schools are gonna be uh, doing that, how do they get outside and, and what kind of activities can we have them do? So just putting that all out there. Is there a Farm River website, any kind of a sort of central place where people can go to learn about what's going on? Uh, no, that doesn't exist currently. Um, it's on the, my list to develop something on the Southwest District page. Um, and I should be able to get to something soon now that we finish this meeting. Um, so that's a, a great suggestion to have uh, like a central hub of information that people could be directed to for the Farm River. Yeah or even testimonials of people who live along the river, you know, what their experience is, uh, what they love about the river. Sure. Well, that'd be great. I mean, maybe we can capture some of that from people that are doing their stream walks. Yeah. Or Chris, maybe you can engage the students and have them make a video. Students are really good at making videos. A good suggestion. Hey, 
Chris, just a suggestion. Has everybody who's in this meeting given you their email address? I know there might be a few new faces and we don't have a, a sign up sheet since we're meeting virtually. Um, I don't know that. I'd have to look through the list of names. Maybe people can type their email in on the uh, or contact information on the chat for you. Yeah, so, or I, I am recording it, so I should be able to get the chat, but my email is also on the screen. So if people just want to send me an email directly, um, that'll also be more streamlined, I think, for me, on my end anyway. Sure. That's that a good would, suggestion. So, so just quickly with Zoom, in the chat box for anybody who wants to save the comments, if you where it says where you can type in the chat there's three little dots and you can save that chat and it already it automatically saves it to your document file under zoom and it saves that whole chat box so any comments and or contact information or if anybody posts a link to something in the chat box you can it, it's a great way to save um so anybody and so you can save anything that's on it any participant can save it as well as the Zoom moderator. Awesome. Denise, that's super helpful. I didn't even know that was there. Yeah, so these three little dots. Yep. So I, ju I just saved it. Yeah, you just saved that chat. So anybody who put stuff in there, it's like, there's good stuff. <laughs> yeah. No, that's really helpful. I didn't know that that was there. I just, since I'm recording the whole meeting, the chat will be captured as part of that, but that's a good way for anybody else on the call to also capture that information. So that's super helpful. Uh, Chris, will the will the um, maps be um, put into the Dropbox? Uh, they can be, because I, I think it would be helpful to have those without having to go through the whole presentation. Just look at individual factors. Um, I thought I, I thought this was a great presentation. I when I saw the, the various maps of the headwaters area where I live, uh, it answered a lot of questions that I've talked to you about in yes. terms of how flashy it is. When you look at the map that shows the number of catch basins and you look at the map that shows the, the uh, development density, uh, it, it, uh, even though we're way up in the headwaters, it, uh, it really explains a lot. So I think it would be helpful to have those, have those maps that you could look at individually. Yeah, Greg, that's a great suggestion. I mean, I can certainly create a folder in the Dropbox for the stakeholder group um, to share those maps and uh, whatever web page or internet um, setup is created, we can also stack those uh, PDFs or TIFFs or JPEGs so that everybody has those, has access to those maps without having to go through the whole presentation. And of course, they will be in the, the final planning document as well. Right. Chris, one other question. Um, mm -hmm. Is it possible to look at our wetland regulations or um, just provide comments and recommendations? Um, similar to the zoning regulation question, I think it would be helpful to look at the wetland regulations. Um, in North Brantford, for example, I think it's maybe even four years ago now, we updated our regulations to expand our review area to 200 feet from the Farm River, mm -hmm. so it's not just the 100-foot upland review area. Um, but if there's any suggestions for other areas that we should have a larger review of um, or more regulations, I think that would be helpful, particularly, particularly for North Brantford. That's really great to know. Um, Eric and Michael, do you think that that would fit into planning and zoning regulation as a well look at wetlands? Yeah, I think so. I, yeah. I think um, looking at the uh, upland review area and some of the basic, um, you know, uh, I guess parameters in, in the regs would be fine. I mean, that's, we did that, you know, for the Niantic uh, watershed too, just kind of looked at a, you know, kind of a cross section of the um, major elements of the inland wetland regs in each town, just for comparison. And again, pretty easy to flag things that um, you know might need some updating, um, especially if you know there's. It sounds like North Brantford is in pretty good shape based on you know, the recent changes, but uh, there may be some other areas that you want to also expand into uh, with a wider, you know, larger upland review area. Right. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you. Uh, 
So, so just, Kara, I guess one of the things you could do is if you send me the regs, I could share them with Eric. Sure. And Michael. Yeah, that'd be great. I can reach out to the other communities in the watershed as well. Okay. I mean, mo most of the towns have had staff at the stakeholder meetings, so it shouldn't be hard to obtain those regs. I'm hearing silence. Does that mean everybody's tuckered out and ready to go have dinner or go to bed? It's dark now. I don't have any lights on in my room. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's exactly what happened to me. <laughs> All right. Well, if everybody is finished, I do appreciate everybody taking the time tonight to learn more about the Farm River. And I look forward to everybody providing more input as we move forward in this process. Uh, and I hope you stay plugged into what we're doing. Uh, and the, the, as I said earlier, the best way to stay plugged in is communicate with me. And I, I do have some email lists that I send things out to for the Farm River. So I can add your emails to that listing. Uh, and as we move forward with other events in the watershed, I can share that information as well. Um, so I, I think with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up. Um, and um, like I said, if anybody has anything else in the future, just communicate with me directly and I can share it to uh, the appropriate stakeholders in the watershed. So with that, I will say thank you and good night. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. Thanks, everyone. Good night with you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Chris. Thank you. Great, thank you. great job, Chris. Amazing, impressive, Eric, and, and everybody involved. Really, really nice. Thanks. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you all.